Hey, you're listening to Mix Front Page with Peter Movilla. Today we'll be discussing the paper entitled Prediction of Occult Uterine Sarcoma Before Hysterectomy for Women with Lyomyoma or Abnormal Bleeding. The case control study aimed to create a risk prediction model for occult uterine sarcoma using preoperative clinical characteristics in women who are undergoing hysterectomy for presumed uterine lyomyoma. Using significant clinical factors associated with 117 cases of occult uterine sarcoma in their database, this risk prediction model was developed to diagnose occult uterine sarcoma before the hysterectomy. The final prediction model included age, race, number of myomas, uterine weight, uterine size increase, degree of pelvic pain, and recent history of blood transfusion. Fortunate to have two of the authors today, Dr. Scott Lentz, a gynecological oncologist and regional director of gynecological oncology for Kaiser Permanente Southern California, and Dr. Eve Zeritsky, an obstetrician gynecologist for the Kaiser Permanente Medical Group at the Oakland Medical Center. Uh, well, I was really fascinated reading this paper. It's one of the reasons I chose it uh, for our, our MIGS audience here um, and readers of JMIG is because it's so practical um, in terms of trying to identify patients a little bit higher risk for uterine sarcoma. Uh, in the benign gynecologic field. So when we meet our patient, there have been many discussions about how we can preoperatively identify those at a little bit higher risk of uterine sarcoma, specifically after the 2014 FDA kind of warning about uh, morselation of uterine fibroids because of the risk of sarcoma. Um, just to start, what was your impetus or motivation for doing this study? Um, because identification of uterine sarcoma is such a problematic thing, and because most patients aren't notified of their sarcoma until after surgery is completed, it really does put the patient and the physician in an awkward position. Um, so being able to identify who might have a sarcoma before their operations seemed to be, it, it would certainly be the optimal situation. Now, the 2014 FDA um, uh, surveillance, the FDA uh, involvement in the issue of power morselation after this, this cluster of morselated sarcomas really was the driving force for us to try to figure out whether we could change uh, clinicians' ability to make diagnoses. Um, we had already identified a very large cohort of uterine sarcomas as part of a, an incidence project that we had published. And so we decided to leverage that data set to see if there were predictors um, that might identify uterine sarcoma so that we could expand the body of literature uh, around this issue. I think when 2014, there was kind of an issue with morselation that occurred of morselation, morselating fibroids and uteruses during laparoscopic cases. And it highlighted kind of the limitations in preoperative prediction of the rare outcome of lyomyosarcoma. Um, so, we wanted to see if there were any reliable predictors that could be used to identify high-risk patients. Since at Kaiser, we kind of have the benefit of having large, uh, large access to da data. Um, we wanted to pool our data from Northern and Southern California and look into our sarcoma. And, you know, our, we had published on our prior research in sarcoma incidents, and then we wanted to look at were there predictors that we could have used to figure out kind of our occult lyomyosarcoma? sarcoma? Yeah. I said you had a really big database utilizing uh, the Kaiser Permanente system in both Northern and Southern California. I'm just going to read a little bit of the numbers from the paper. 85,750 hysterectomies with 273 sarcomas. That's about one in 314 hysterectomies. And 43.2 of them were occult, meaning no suspicion at time of surgery for any cancer, leaving 117 patients with occult uterine sarcomas to compare to some of the controls. So that's a pretty good end. So which clinical characteristics did you find to be significantly more present in patients with occult uterine sarcoma compared to those without any sarcoma? So if you reference our table one in the paper, if you have it up while you're watching this recording, um, we found that certain things did have increased predictors as individual predictors, um, having a solitary fibroid, large fibroid, significant increase in uterine size or no baseline imaging study to assess uterine size, um, needing a blood transfusion and opioid use for pain. Now the issue of whether there was no baseline study also seems kind of counterintuitive um, that if the patient has no previous imaging, how could that possibly predict that there might be a sarcoma going on? 
and we did sort of address this in the discussion a little bit to say that our, our suspicion was that that is the group of patients, if there's a rapid size increase, that cannot wait for a subsequent imaging study to determine whether there's actually change happening on those patients. And so patients who previously had radiologic measurement of their uterus may represent sort of a safer category. Well, next, I wanted to talk about the ASCO uh, risk model. And I really appreciate that your paper actually put the calculator that you created with the logistic regression model. So figure two, you have kind of your risk thresholds that the calculator would put out based on those preoperative characteristics that you determined were significant for patients. And you created, it looks like, uh, four different thresholds of risk. So patients with a 0.5% risk based on the calculator, a 1% risk, a 1.5% risk, or a 2% risk. And it looks like you were trying to um, move it around to see what the sensitivities and specificities were to kind of determine what would be a, a nice cutoff. Is that correct? Right. So this paper is a little bit in, a little bit unique in the sense that um, we created a risk predicting model using case control data, which is not typically how it's done. Um, usually, you, you know, you you use large population prevalence information to, to create predictive models, but in the case of uterine sarcoma, because it's such an uncommon event. You have to use, we had to use case control data in order to, to create this model. So there was some brilliant statistical processing done that I'm not even going to try to touch. Um, but it, it did yield this predictive model that we were able to create. And so, as you, as you mentioned in the figure, um, we sort of played with different threshold levels to see what predictive ability we had at various cut points. Um, so when we when we used the strictest cutoff, which was the 0.5% level, the sensitivity at that point was about 0.61, meaning that it captured more than half of the women who had a sarcoma in, in this group. The, the problem was the positive predictive value at that level was very, very low. Was It only captured about 1.3% of women with a positive test proved to actually have a sarcoma. And that's really not terribly useful for a clinician. So if you, to phrase it another way, if you take a hypothetical sample of about 10,000 women using that threshold cut point, you'll characterize about 1,200 women as having a sarcoma, but only 16 of them will actually prove to have that cancer. On the other side of the coin, the remaining 8,700 women that the model would say are low risk will still contain 10 women that do have a sarcoma. Yeah. So if you look at the higher cut point at about 2%, um, using that same hypothetical population, you can trim down the at-risk women to about 200, um, and that'll capture 11 women with sarcomas, but you'll miss 15 sarcomas from the remaining 9,700 women in that theoretical cohort. So the the predictive model was, uh, we thought, was a really exciting finding, but the mathematics really start to prove to be unworkable, which was, which was really interesting in, in terms of our results. I was a little bit disappointed, to be honest, and I think we all were. Um, I was really excited to see that we had some predictive things like uterine size, uh, transfusion, opioid use, or... Um, and I thought that if we put this into a model, that this would come up with with predictors that we could then share with, you know, other people. So unfortunately, as illustrated, the hypothetical scenario using the model did not do as well as we'd hoped. Um, we'd hoped at telling us who actually does have a sarcoma. Um, so our findings do highlight the sobering reality that, like, low disease prevalence of uterine sarcoma makes it hard to have a test that is clinically more useful than kind of guessing. And the post-test -probab post probability of disease using our model is not much better than we already know based on the low prevalence. No, I know. I, I find this area tough because I was very excited too, especially with that lower threshold, with the positive predictive value, presumably because the lower prevalence of just the disease, I imagine, similar to ovarian cancer with ultrasound and CA125. Right. I was wondering, do you think that this model could be used as kind of a two-step where this could be the first sensitive test, and then if they kind of pass that lower risk threshold of 0.5%, 0 
going to the more expensive tests, like what you had brought up in your introduction in MRI and endometrial biopsy and the LDH uh, isoenzyme three as a kind of a well, algorithm? Initially, I think our goal was exactly to do that. Um, I used the model to sort of call out the women that were low enough risk that you wouldn't need to do subsequent testing. But the problem was that it's not clear that any of the subsequent testing would resolve those dilemmas. Um, things like MRI predictors or, or LDH isoforms really haven't um, risen to the level of, of significant predictive ability. Um, where MRI is concerned, there still are no uniform sort of characteristics that radiology will use to pinpoint normal versus sarcoma. So, you know, the MRI may be a very effective second step in a, in a two-step two strategy, but until there's sort of consistent radiologic descriptors, MRI is neither sensitive nor specific right now. So we, there still needs to be quite a bit more research before we can advocate for that kind of strategy. What do you see this future preoperative risk assessment for uterine sarcomas? Do you see anything like ultrasound uh, guided uterine biopsies or cell-free uh, DNA markers for lyomyosarcoma being utilized in the future at all? Yeah, I think if there's one conclusion that our study highlights is the fact that a novel approach is probably needed to kind of move the needle of disease prediction. Um, we can't, at this point, we can't really recommend doing percutaneous biopsy or cell-free DNA testing in the absence of any well-designed research to divine predictive values. Um, there's not really, for just for a core needle biopsy, for example, there's no information about positive or negative predictive value of a uterine mass in order to determine whether that approach would be helpful. I, I wish I was as innovative and able to think outside the box in terms of what the future will be, but hopefully there will be some sort of serum testing that you can look for some of these diseases or rare diseases that we see. Thank you both so much for your time in recording this podcast. I'm really excited to see uh, how our audience reacts to such a you know, great paper and this great conversation. Thank you again so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Well, thank you to the audience for listening to our MIGS front page video podcast. And thank you to JMIG for sponsoring us and allowing us to continue recording uh, these great podcasts. I look forward to seeing you all at the next podcast.